am continuing on with my series on, on end times events. So we did an entire timeline of, of the book of Revelation, essentially. And then we've covered the day of the Lord and the abomination of desolation. And what I'm going to cover tonight is the, the topic of the judgment seat of Christ. So this is another event that's yet to happen. Uh, the timing for this, and we'll see this, is at the, after the first resurrection. So if you remember uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about the resurrections in the grand scheme of things. You have Christ the first fruits. After that, they that are Christ's at his coming, which is the first resurrection, and then come at the end, and that's the second resurrection. We also see in the Bible is the resurrection of the just and there's a resurrection of the unjust. So at the first resurrection, it's the resurrection where the believers, what we also call the rapture, it's another term that's commonly used for that first resurrection. It's when the dead in Christ are going to rise. And then those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we be uh, with the Lord. So at that event, that precedes the millennial reign of Christ, the 1,000 years that Christ is going to rule and reign on this earth. So you have the first resurrection that takes place. We will be raptured. If we're still alive, we'll be raptured together. If we're, if we're not physically alive in the flesh, then our bodies will come up out of the grave. They'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We'll have a brand new body. And our, our soul and spirit will be reunited with our flesh. New flesh, new body, will be with Christ. Now, as we saw from our timeline, I'm not going to go through all that again. You can go through, back through the sermons recently on Sunday nights, um, going through this, this timeline. There's going to be a time of wrath where God's pouring out his wrath on the unbelievers, on those that uh, took the mark of the beast, on, on, on the, the world, essentially, um, after that rapture takes place and that's going to continue for approximately three and a half years before Christ ultimately is setting up his throne and his kingdom here on earth. So um, we're going to get more into the timeline stuff uh, at a future uh, sermon, but I want to cover this topic tonight because this event of the judgment seat of Christ, which we write about as reference here in Romans chapter 14. This is throughout the Bible quite a bit, actually. I've got a lot of content, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to manage my time the best I can. I might have to skip some references just so you understand how much the Bible does talk about this event. It's, it's quite extensive, actually. Um, and this is an event, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give a prologue here to give you as much information as possible at the high level, and then we'll dig into all the passages and prove what I'm stating now from Scripture so we can see the scriptural evidence behind what I'm trying to teach you just at this moment right now. So, um, and, and what the judgment seat of Christ is going to represent is what we're going to see is that this is where believers will be judged according to their works. Okay, this is not to gain access or gain entrance into the kingdom of God. This is not have anything to do with your salvation, whether or not you're going to heaven or hell, because that has nothing to do with your works. We are saved by grace, so our sins are covered completely and separated from us as far as the east is from the west, through the blood of Jesus Christ and the gift that he just gives us and gives us, he grants us forgiveness of sins. So this judgment, I just want to be clear, and we'll see this as we go through, it has nothing to do with your sin, but it does have to do with what you've done with your life and how you've lived your life. Now, in the scripture, when we, when we see references to hell, there are a few places that talk about different levels of hell. There's the lowest hell, or, or people are warned about receiving the greater damnation in hell, right? So we can see references to, you know, within hell that there's some places that are even worse. Well, similarly, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you know, people who are saved, hey, everybody who's saved will go to heaven when they die. 
but there's a level, there's more rewards, there are, there are bonuses or prizes, if you will, crowns, also the biblical term that's used, that's given based on the life that you've lived here on this earth. So your existence in eternity, your existence with everlasting life will be, some will be better than others. Now look, it's all great if you're saved, <laughs> right? I mean, even, even the lowest position in heaven is, is way leaps and bounds greater than the coldest part of hell, Amen. right? <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's a world of difference there. Obviously, being saved is the most important thing, making sure, hey, I've got eternal life because Christ paid my way. Amen. And what I love about this doctrine and, and what I love about God himself is that I, I think this even emphasizes more completely the free gift of salvation. Because he gives that to us for free. Just you put your trust in Christ. That is yours. That is a free gift. He's given that to you. So then anything that you do for Christ on top of that, the, your obedience to Christ, the, the, the work that you do for him, he pays you for. He will give you rewards for it. He will give on top of that. Now, he doesn't have to do that. Right? I mean, saving our souls, we are indebted to, to Christ forever, Amen. just in general, right? Just because he did that. But he's not going to accept any payment from us because salvation is a free gift. Because he doesn't want to mix anything of what he did with what we can do in regards to our salvation. That's 100% Christ. All glory, all credit, all honor goes to Christ. And one more way of ensuring that is God saying, okay, well, now everything that you do, when you listen to me, when you obey me, when you do what I want you to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add on top of that. Because this is a free gift. Your salvation, your eternal life is free. So now I will reward you when you do good and when you do well. This is what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Now, let's dig in to this passage because I also... Want to, want to see, I, I want to point out something that I've noticed through my study of this that you may or may not have seen before. We have a tendency to be, when if you're thinking about standing before, I mean, think about the judgment seat of Christ. Christ is sitting on the throne, right? You imagine yourself there being in front of Christ and being judged for your works. It's a very personal thing. We may be thinking to ourselves, hey, what might that be like? And be thinking about sins or thinking about other things you do. But what I want to point out, and I want you to follow, as we read through these passages, I may or may not remember to point it out to you. Be thinking about, it has a lot, I don't want to say everything, but a lot to do with other people. With how you build on others not as much what you do for yourself. This is how we will be judged. So it will be judged on our works for other people. So now keep that in mind and say, okay, I don't know about that. Pastor. Well, let's keep that in mind as we go through these passages and see if that rings true in Scripture. We started in Romans chapter 14, which, by the way, Romans chapter 14 is all about how to deal with other brethren, other believers. And you have some that are weak in the, weaker in the faith and some that are stronger. You have some that are not quite right on some doctrines and others that, that, that are, have the doctrine down pat, right? And the overall teaching of Romans 14 is, you know what? Let those guys be. Help them out. Don't throw any stumbling blocks before your brother or sister in Christ if they're struggling with some issue or some doctrine, it's not some big deal. It's not some, you know, fundamental doctrine. You know, they, they have a problem with, oh, I don't think I could eat this. And, 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 and oh, it's okay, you could eat that. Or someone thinking like, oh, this day, I want to separate this day and make it holy. And we can, you know, and it's like, no, you can, you can treat every day. Like th these types of things, they're smaller issues. They're smaller doctrines. You say, you know what? If someone has, a, has a, an issue with that, don't, don't go trying to, rub their face in something or, 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 or go after it with a, with a bad attitude that might cause them to stumble. Just deal with it, be long-suffering, say, okay, you know, 
go, go about making accommodation for the weaker brother or sister in Christ. That is how we would have love or charity in our heart towards our brethren. And that's what it's, it's talking about at the beginning and at the end of Romans 14, and then smack dab in the middle, we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. That's not a coincidence that this just happens to be thrown in there between those two concepts in Romans chapter 14. So let's look at verse number seven. The Bible says, for none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. We don't live for ourselves as believers. We shouldn't. Just as Christ didn't live for himself, he lived for everybody but himself, we should have that same mind and that same attitude. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Verse 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In this context, judging your brother, saying him or not, it's over these little things, these little issues. He's saying, why are you judging your brother? Why are you setting him at naught? Hey, everybody's going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Just let it be. Show grace. And I don't even think as much for the other person, well, yeah, that person's got to answer for himself, but you're going to have to answer for yourself. Why are you causing that person to stumble? How about you bless that person and build that person up and edify that person and help that person to grow and to learn? That's what you should be worried about then for the judgment seat of Christ for you. The Bible says in verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, I also want to make this point too, because we're going to see this as we continue on as well. And turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, while I'm expounding this a little bit. The Bible says, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Giving an account is not necessarily implying giving an answer for all of your sins. Jesus paid for all of our sins. I mean, what, a, what answer could you give to God anyways for your sin? I mean, think about that. This happens at the, at the, after the first resurrection. We're in our glorified body. We don't have that sinful flesh anymore. So if God's going to be asking you, hey, why did you sin? Because my flesh is weak or was weak, no one will have a good answer. Okay. Giving an account, though, it's, it's not as much the focus on what did you do wrong, it's what did you do. Right? So if you have to give an account, okay, you have this job to do, and then when you're done with that job, you give an account. Right? Like think about in business. You have you have somewhat you have a project that you're tasked with doing. And then at the end of that project, you go back to your boss and he wants you to give an account. What happened, right? Tell me everything that happened. That's giving an account for yourself. And at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be giving an account for your life. So what have you done? We're the Lord's servants. What did you, okay, you're, you're, you've reached the end. The work day is over. Give an account now. What have you done? This is going to be our judgment. In, in a little while, what actually happens to those who say, yeah, I kind of took a really long break. <laughs> I, I, I made myself look I do anything, God. And, and we'll see soon that, you know, that person's still saved. They're not really going to get rewarded. The bonus check isn't coming in for that person. <laughs> but 
nevertheless, they are so saved. It's giving an account, right? It's not an answering for all of your sins. And some people get confused about this. There's a second judgment that we see in Revelation chapter 20, which is the great white throne judgment, which happens after the millennial reign of Christ, when heaven and earth is passed away, and then everybody's just standing before this great, great white throne, and, and death and hell deliver up the dead which are in it, and the, and the dead are standing before God, and then they are judged according to their works out of the law. Out of the books of God, out of, out of God's law, they're going to be judged according to their works in that sense because they don't have Christ, and then they're going to pay for all their sins in eternity in the lake of fire. So that is a different judgment. It is of their works, but that is all of their breaking of the commandments, whereas the judgment seat of Christ is not about your sin. It's about what did you do for the cause of Christ. It's, it's the positive side of things versus the negative side of things. Because the negative side of things for us, hey, Christ has, has made that balance. He's, he's paid that in full. So we don't have that debt to owe. But now he's asking, well, what did you do? And then he's going to give rewards for that. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's look at verse number 13. The Bible says, we having the same spirit of faith, According as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Now, He's talking about the resurrection, talking about us being raised up, right? Because this is ap right after his first resurrection is when this judgment seat of Christ is going to take place. And he's saying, hey, we're going to be raised up with you, and you're going to be present with us. We're going to be there together because you're saved, we're saved, we're going to be part of this first resurrection, and all things are for your sakes, Remember I mentioned that before. Pick up on these clues as we keep going, how much it's about other people. For which cause, verse 16, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So, the affliction that you may suffer in this lifetime, in this flesh, in this body here on earth, he says, look, first of all, it's but for a moment. Our life is like a vapor which appeareth for a short time and then vanisheth away, the Bible says. It's, it's a very quick, and especially if you're going to compare that to all of eternity. <laughs> right? We are here for a very short period of time. Right. Decades is... is tiny, it's insignificant on the grand timeline of eternity. It is, it is a blink of the eye. So if we suffer, if we are afflicted in this life, well, this is how we will be judged, and whatever we receive from God, we will have for eternity. So, so weigh that in your mind Am I willing to suffer? Am I willing to be exhausted? Am I willing to be tired? Am I willing to be afflicted? Am I willing to go through any suffering for the cause of Christ? But in knowing this is very temporary, this is very short. And if I know that if I can just keep faithful and just do what's right and just, and just push through to the end, God has a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There is a glory, a brightness, a shining that God gives to those that serve him. And some glory is greater than others. We see that. There's other references in scripture about that. But we're seeing here, look, if you can just make it through that light affliction, God has so much more abundant glory and honor for you. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
For the things which are seen are temporal. That's the short term. Anything we see in this life, the things that we can just see with our eyes physically, this is all going to be gone. This whole world is going to be burned up. Amen. The money, the cars, the houses, the things that people like to live for in this time, in this day, in this age, on this planet, on this earth, it's all going to be gone. Amen. So don't set your eyes on these things. If you've got a vehicle that's peeling off all the paint and it's bare, it doesn't matter. That's not going to be there. You don't have to spend all your time trying to make sure that you get so much money so you can have the fanciest car and the fanciest house. It doesn't matter. That's a waste of time. Focus things that are eternal because the things that are not seen are the things that are eternal. We, we don't see Jesus Christ with our eyes. We don't see the, the, the throne of God. We don't see these things right now. We will see these things. We know that we're going to see these things. Amen. We know Christ is going to set up his kingdom here on earth. We know it's going to happen. We just don't see it. But we act and we walk by faith on the things that we don't see, knowing that they carry this eternal weight of glory. Verse, uh, let's keep reading now into chapter 5, because this, this, I wanted to start in chapter 4. It gives us the context as we go into 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which then is going to talk also about the judgment seat of Christ. So it started off in chapter 4 where we picked up, talking about the faith, talking about the resurrection, talking about this eternal weight of glory. Now into chapter 5, verse number 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, he's talking about this body, were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Now, you will also notice in relation, especially to the judgment seat of Christ, references to building in a house or a tabernacle, which would also be a structure, and our bodies. These are being used, you know, the, 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 the house, the tabernacle the, is being used synonymously with our body, with our flesh, okay? So we have a flesh right now, our earthly tabernacle, but we have a body that's going to be reserved for us in heaven that God's going to give us a brand new body. Amen. And we will be clothed upon with that body, with that house, with that tabernacle of God, which is from heaven. So verse 2 is saying, in this we groan. We are desiring that new body. We are in a body of flesh and a body of sin now, when, you know, sin, th this flesh is causing us to have these lustly desires and things that would take us away from God. It also has physical pains and ailments and other things that are a result of sin. At the end of the day, all of the degradation of our body, when sin entered into the world, then death entered into the world. God made us perfect. God made everything great. Sin came into the world and corrupted everything. So even our bodies now are corrupted and have this natural uh, lifespan, which originally mankind didn't have a lifespan. It was eternal life until sin entered in. Then death entered in. But we're going to go back to his original plan in receiving new sinless bodies, which is great. Of course, we are looking forward to this. We're earnestly desiring to have this from heaven. Our, we're groaning internally. Man, I can't wait for that day. And the older we get and the more aches and pains you get, you're going, man, I can't wait to have that body where I don't have to have the back aches and the knee aches and all the other you know, things that cause us pain here. Whew, I can't wait to have a nice, perfect body clothed upon from heaven. If so be that being clothed there, verse number three, we shall not be found naked. If you don't have a body reserved for you, you won't have a covering. You won't, you, you'll, you'll be exposed. You'll, you'll have that shame of your nakedness be exposed. 
which is not a good place to be before God. You need covering. You need to be covered from your sin. Verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. He's saying it's not like we just want to lose this body and have nothing. We're looking for that new body, right? We're looking to have this mortality swallowed up of life and just have that brand new body. That's what we're really looking forward to. Verse 5, now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. When you get saved by putting your trust in Christ, there's not a full salvation of body, soul, and spirit in that moment. Okay? You have the new man, there's a new creature that's born again inside of you. That's the new spirit. But we still have this old flesh, this old body, but see, the Bible's saying, well, God has laid down an earnest, and he's given us the spirit, his spirit, as the seal of the promise that we will be fully redeemed one day, that he is going to give us a new body, that we are going to have that full ultimate redemption. And to prove that, he's given us the earnest of the spirit. He's, he's putting, mo he's putting his, mo his money down, right? He's going, okay, I'm going to put the spirit down on you. Which, again, it makes sense, especially as we're relating this to houses and everything else. You want to buy a house, you normally put down earnest money, which is money that you can't get back. You put that down, and if you're going to walk away from that house, you lose that money. Now, if God's giving us the Holy Spirit, how likely is he going to be to walk away from the, from the Holy Spirit? Right? He, ca he can't. He, it's, not that, it's not that there's even a choice there. So when God puts earnest down on every person who's saved, there is no going back from that. I mean, he is bound right. to you Amen. by putting that earnest of the Spirit Amen. within you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There, there is no, there's no, well, maybe you could lose yourself. No. no. Not when God has sealed you with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. God doesn't go back on his promises. God's not going to say, oh, yeah, I want that. Oh, no, I changed my mind. No, men do that, which is why you got to put earnest money down. <laughs> Yeah, let God be true, but every man a liar. But God still does put that earnest down. He gives us that confidence. He gives us that hope, and he knows. He lets us know this is for real. This is forever. This, you are sealed. Amen. Therefore, as we have this earnest, because we know we have this home, because God has sealed us with that Holy Spirit of promise, therefore, we are always confident, always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Because we have that earnest of the Holy Spirit, we know, we're confident that whatever day it is that this body drops dead, we're going to be present with the Lord. Amen. We're confident, we're willing, absent from this body right now and just be with God. Because that's great. That's a great place to be. Amen. But we have the kind of, there is no doubt about it. Verse 9. Wherefore, after absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, he, we just got done, and this is next. This should dispel all doubts of like, well, maybe I'm saved. You know, no, it's confident. We know this is, this is sure. We've got the earnest of the spirit. So now when we come up to a verse that says, well, now we work. Now we labor. That whether present or absent, we might be accepted of him. This being is talking about your salvation. Yeah. It's not. Okay, works, people who believe in a works-based salvation might like to point to this and like, see, look, you have to work, you have to labor. No, it, it already established, just read it in the context, it already established there is no work involved in that. Amen. You've already been bought. You, it, it's, it's the same way, but say, well, then what is it talking about, Pastor? Why is it talking about we have to labor, we may be accepted of him? It's very simple. Think about a person, you know, we're born again, we're children of God. Think about a child who... No matter what they do is a child. My son 
Jonathan, for example, he's my son no matter what. No matter what he does, he's my son. Nothing's going to change that. He has a home reserved for him permanently in my house. Now, he still is going to work and strive to be accepted of me. Right? <coughs> Nothing will change the fact that he's my son, but he's going to want to please me and be acceptable in my sight and be a son that could, that could be an honorable son to his father and not a shame. Right? He's already confident and knows, hey, you've got a home. We know that we will be with the Lord when we breathe our last breath, but we still want to be acceptable to God when he comes back. We want to do a work and say, hey, God, I, I hope you're pleased with what I've done. Thank you for providing for me. Thank you for giving me a home. Thank you for, for taking care of my sin debt that I owed. Now I want to, to show you that I love you by working for you, and I want to be acceptable to you. I want to be pleasing to you. This is, at the end of the day, then the reckoning or the give. Was I acceptable? Here's, here's what I ended up doing in the years that you gave me. Here it is. Will he say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Well done. Good job. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Wherefore we labor, verse 9 of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to be there. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, good or bad is a value. The value of what you've done. It's not necessarily talking about uh, sin here. Right? We have a tendency to think of bad as something sinful, but even throughout Scripture, and, and I didn't want to put this in my notes because it's already a lot, I have a lot of Scripture to, to cover, going all the way back to the sacrifices, to the offerings that people would make, if, if, uh, if an animal had a broken bone, if it had any type of blemish in it, it was considered bad. Okay, That doesn't mean that animal did any sin but it wasn't acceptable. It wasn't appropriate. It, wa it wasn't what God wanted, right? right? So God wants the good sacrifices. He wants the good work, but we're, he's going to separate the good from the bad. Amen. People do work, and they might think at the time it's acceptable to God, but if you're going to find out the judgment of Christ, yeah, it actually wasn't acceptable. That was bad work. It doesn't automatically imply it's sinful. It's not about the sin. It's about what have you done. There's lots of things in this world that we do that isn't inherently sinful, but you're not necessarily serving the Lord either. It's, it's, you can do good things, right? In the sight of was the work good or bad, it's going to be considered bad, right? The, the work that I do, I mean, the work that I do outside of here, I work on servers, I work with scan guns, I work with programs and code on computers, and I do all these different things, and I help make other people's job easier and more efficient, and I help our business make more money, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing sinful that I do at, on my job, at my work, that I spend my time doing. But how much of that do you think God's going to look, look at the judgment of Christ? He's going to say, okay, David, you, here's all the work that you've done in your life. How much of that is going to be considered good when it comes to being rewarded for the things of God? Not much. <laughs> that work isn't what now now uh, oh, maybe this much to say well you provided for your family okay Wh whatever whatever that does for you by not being a deadbeat by by being able to provide 
uh, you know, the, 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 the food and the clothing and, and provide for my own. I wasn't worse than an infidel, <laughs> right? That, that's already telling me it's probably not some big reward. If, it, if it's likened to being worse than an infidel, if you don't take care of your own, especially those of your own household. But you see what I'm saying, right? Those things can be done that are not sinful, they're not wrong, but it's just not going to get you anything. God's going to look at that and go, yeah, I don't really see the value in that. Why? Because he's, because he's already promised. He says, look, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. So all the things that you get through your, through your work and other things, he's like, I had to provide that for you anyways. You just follow me. You could have you been making rewards and earning income in your 401k in heaven Amen. this whole time if you weren't so worried about your 401k on the earth that's burned up and gone now so when it's talking about things whether it be good or bad you know understand that sacrifices were looked at as bad you know, there's even, in, I think in Ezekiel, it talks about the figs. There were some, some figs that are good, and there's figs that are bad. Well, you just can't eat the bad figs. They're not sinful. They're just not good. Not so good is bad, right? It's a just understand what, what this is talking about here. Then verse number 11 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Again, okay, we know the terror of the Lord. We know that God is a terrible God. God instills terror in people, and he should. The almighty, the all-powerful, not just should, he does. Okay, anyone who comes across God, any man who comes in the presence of the Lord, every single one without fail falls down on their face and trembles and is, is, is in awe and, and in terror by being in the presence of God because of who God is. And I'm talking about people who are saved, people who are prophets, people who are great men of God. But being in the presence of the holiness of God is going to instill terror in any human, in the best human being on this planet. Amen. Yeah. Look at Job. Job was greater at his time than anyone else on the whole earth. God was bragging on Job to Satan, right? But then when God shows up, <coughs> Job's not talking a big game at all. He's, he's humble. He's on his face, and he's just, sorry, God. <laughs> You're right. I'm wrong. And he was the most righteous person. And there's, but it's not a fear of, God's, oh, well, maybe God will throw me to hell. Just because he, that there's a terror of the Lord, well, what do we have to be afraid of then if you can't go to hell? Well, there's a lot to still be afraid of if you can't go to hell. And even just being in his presence will instill that terror. Now, look, knowing who God is, already going to be in front of the Lord, don't you want to be in good standing <laughs> with a lot to offer when you're standing before the Almighty who instills terror in everybody that's in front of the Lord? Or do you want to just stand there with nothing? <laughs> I'll tell you, you're going to want to have something to bring, not because you're worried about being cast in hell, not because you're worried about this punishment. Look, Christ paid for the punishment for your sins, but you're not going to want to be standing there with nothing, empty-handed. You're going to want to be there saying, look, God, I did this for you. So he could, so he could have something positive to say. <laughs> Great. Good job. Right? I mean, it, it, we don't have to, have to read too much into this and make it about something else, especially when we have so much scripture talking about our eternal life, talking about our salvation, talking about how, how we are separated from our sin. Okay, Th these are passages that some people like to take and twist and turn them into something they're not. Now flip back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I have 
way too many passages. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't cover them all tonight. We're doing the main ones first, and then everything else we've seen in these main passages. So we see the judgment of Christ in those first two passages explicitly spelled out by name. Okay, Now we're going to see more supporting information, but not necessarily saying the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, but it's talking about the same event. It's talks, you know, we'll see that it's talking about the resurrection. We'll see references to crowns and rewards and things like that. This all is doled out, given out at the judgment seat of Christ. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 5, the Bible says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now we're starting back this far in the context just to bring up the soul winning reference, the reference of preaching the gospel to other people. This is important. This is going to be a big part of the judgment seat of Christ. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, I have planted a pile of water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. At the end of the day, God is the one who gets all the credit and glory and honor for salvation, right? But you still have the workers doing the work. It doesn't matter if you're doing the watering. It doesn't matter if you're doing the plowing. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter which aspect of the work you're doing. All the increase comes of God. But we still have workers. And it says, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. God gives the increase, but you know what? The laborers still get rewarded for doing work. The credit and glory and honor goes to the, to the Lord. He's the life giver. It's his word that we're preaching. It's his salvation <laughs> that we're pointing people to. It's his free gift, right? But we still are going to be rewarded for doing the work in this regard of bringing the gospel to people. And this is one specifically, if you're wondering, well, how am I going to get rewards in heaven that everyone's going to get reward according to his labor in this very context? So especially if you're visiting our church, if you're new to our church, and you, you see us talking about this, and we've gotten the first page of your book, you know, salvation, the baptism, why do you care about this? Why are you recording this? Why are you making a big deal out of it? Because it is a big deal. Amen. Because it's, it's the most important thing that a believer can do. Amen. Bring the gospel to other people. That's, that is the, the, the heart and soul of this church. We care a lot about it. And this is having an eternal vision. Not one of this life. We're investing our time and our resources and our energy on things we can't see. When someone gets saved, you don't see the new spirit inside of that person. You don't see it. When they put their trust in Christ, we get bored maybe, right? But we don't get to see it. But we know it's worthwhile. Because there's going to come a day where not only are we going to be before the judgment of Christ, but so are they. And, and we'll see the references to that as, as well. Let's, let's keep reading here. So we're going to receive a reward according to, our own, to his own labor, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Now it talks about the building. Ye are God's building. So we are God's work animals. We're the workhorses. But we work together with God. So Christ works with us. We, uh, all the soul winning efforts that we do, if we just went out there on our own, we would see no results. But the Lord needs to be with us. The Holy Ghost needs to be with us and endure us with that power to be able to preach the word of God and see those salvations but he still uses us as his vehicles to do that. Amen. If we were to stop, if every believer on this earth were to stop preaching the word of God, stop preaching the gospel, nobody would get saved. Yeah. It's not because God's not powerful. It's because he's chosen to use his laborers, to, uh, you know, to use us, us believers, to be the ones that will deliver his message. And it's incumbent upon us because he's committed a job to us. The Bible says he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation, that we are to reconcile the lost to Christ. Amen. 
that we are to bring the good news and that word of reconciliation, that good news that Christ paid for us, we need to bring that to him, to a lost world. That's our job. He's committed that to us. But as a result of doing so, because people like to say, oh, well, if you're saved anyways, then why would you do anything? Well, lots of reasons. One, because I just love God, Amen. and I'm thankful that he paid for my sins. Is that good enough for you? Amen. You know, the people that want to argue about, oh, you weren't saved, always saved, you know, well, then why would you ever do anything? I mean, why don't you just go and just live and do a bunch of sin and everything else? I mean, you're just going to go to heaven anyways. Well, one, because God doesn't want me to do that, and I love God. And I'm thankful. And that it's because of those things that gave me a problem with God to begin with. Yeah. Now I want to do what's right because I'm thankful that he saved me. Amen. And if that's not enough, how about God also promised to reward me too. Now look, if you do this, he says, I'll pay you. I'll give you the reward. You labor for me and I will reward you. Great. Another reason to serve God. Amen. It's not because I'm worried about going to hell. There's so many other reasons. How about you also care about your fellow man? <laughs> I don't, you look at people in the face and you go, yeah, that if, you know, if you just think to yourself, hey, that person might just burn in hell. That person might just burn in hell. That person might just burn in hell. At some point, are you going to go, well, maybe I should say something? Yeah. Or do you just not care? You don't have to just be motivated by hell. Especially after you're saved. There's no reason to be. You don't need to be. You were not motivated. After that, it's a whole different relationship. Why? Because you're a child of God. All right, let's keep reading. Um, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So this is talking about a, a, a foundation of salvation. That foundation is poor as Jesus Christ. He's the rock. He's the stone. He's the foundation. There is no other foundation. That is the only one. A person has to be saved. has to be in Christ. But now you can build upon that. Right now, we have an opportunity, I think, to build upon our own house. But if you think about it, he says, I have laid the foundation in the sense that he has poured Christ into someone else's life. And then someone else is going to come and build upon that. So Paul, as an evangelist, he's going around and preaching the gospel. And then they're going to get plugged into another church, and they're going to have teachers and, and other people that are going to build on that foundation. I think the works that we do are good how other people's lives turn out. Everyone that's going to be their work that you've done on other people. Because you're building, right? The whole point, again, go back to Christian life. Is it about you? And what can I do to build up? Or is it about other people? It's about edifying. It's about building. It's about reaching other people and helping to strengthen them. You are building their building for them. In so doing... That's how God is going to judge your work. Verse number 12, build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So, 
all of the works that we do when you're building up, some of it's going to be good and some of it's going to be bad, as we already saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The good and the bad referred to here, you have gold, silver, precious stones. Now, if you were to put any of those things in the fire, it won't burn up. Gold, silver, precious stones, they abide through the fire. They're going to come out on the other end still. But then there's also uh, wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble will all burn in the fire. They're all going to come to nothing. You're going to end up... Now, again, it's, is there anything wrong with wood, hay, and stubble? No, but it's not eternal value. That's not going to last. It's not necessarily sinful, but if you're building, if all of your work and all of your building is just wood, hay, and stubble, helping, you're not doing, well, that's all going to be gone. But you're still saved. All your works will be burned up. The efforts in your life, well, that didn't turn out to be much of anything. Because you didn't have the gold, you didn't have the silver, you didn't have the precious stones. the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you if any man defile the temple of God him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy which temple ye are and you know we are because we have the Holy Ghost residing in us we're the temple of God and we do have to to worry about if we just decide to defile our bodies and go into fornication and adultery and all kinds of other things you know what God can just destroy your body here on earth and then take you out early and you know what if you're if you are taken early out of this race you're not going to win the prize you're not going to have these uh rewards to rack up for eternal value we want to now look as much as we see hey it's so much better to be with god and to be in a new body and to be in the presence of the lord and everything else it's better than where we're at right now but you also have to consider we ought to want to still stay in this life <laughs> because it's what we do in this life that's going to give us the rewards for eternity. Right. So the longer you can stay here and serve the Lord, the better your eternity will be. Makes sense, right? So, so we're not like, well, then why don't you just kill yourself then? Because then you can go be... But our eternity will be so much better by serving him our lives now. There are crowns to win, works. There are rewards. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to have to blow through a lot more of these passages that I wanted to cover. I, I didn't realize how long it was going to take me to get to this point. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, it's our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming for ye are our glory and joy he's saying you all I go, ye y'all okay <laughs> in the south ye is just y'all it's it's very easy <laughs> translation there okay y'all are in the presence of Lord Jesus Christ is coming because y'all are saved Right? Just like I'm saved. Y'all are saved. So we're all going to be in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he's saying, what is our hope? What's, what's my hope? What's my joy? What's my crown of rejoicing? It's y'all. Why? Because if, if I'm trying to build you up and if I'm trying to do all these things for you, then when you are there and can give account for yourself, well, I'm going to get some credit for what you've done. Because I was helping build you up. Mm -hmm. 
That's some good news. You are our glory and our joy. Man, the, the infinite wisdom of the Lord is magnificent. And this literally just dawned upon me right now. But think about the concept. Where does glory come from? Anyway? Can anyone just take their own glory and just take that on themselves and just lift themselves up? No, that's prideful. That's proud. That's pride, right? God hates pride. It's one of the worst sins of the Bible. That's what Satan fell into pride. But if you keep your head down and you just do work, you're doing everything for other people, the glory is going to come from everybody else. It's not going to come from you. God will give you and reward you then for all that work that you've done that will be evident in every other life that you've touched. But that will speak for you. You won't speak for yourself. See, the people in Matthew 7... Oh, devils, and I did this, and I did that, and I did that. We're not going to be saying this at the judgment seat of Christ. Those are the people that didn't know God, and they're trusting in their works to save them. And that's why I knew you. When the believers are standing for the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to know his terror. We're going to be like, uh, I hope, <laughs> hope I did good. I hope, you know, like, let's see what a bow, let's see what my, my life work is, and then Oh, man, yeah, hey, you made it, and you made it, and you made it, and you're here, and you're here. Because we don't know for certain anyone else's salvation but our own. I mean, I believe everybody here is saved. I believe that. But I don't know that. I know one person in this room is saved. <laughs> Me. I know my own salvation, okay? <laughs> you are saved, right? I have no reason to doubt that. But I don't know. But see, we will know one day for a certainty. We will know those who maybe, unfortunately, never understood, but we thought were saved. There might be those who pretended and put on a show, but they weren't really saved. They won't be there. And then you may be others that you might have helped or done something for, and then you lost contact with, and you know, but then maybe a decade later, something that you did, some influence that you had on their life, seed that was planted, and then you, and then you see, oh, oh. And we don't know, we'll, but we'll see those time. But if you're sowing, you're going to reap sparingly. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not putting forth that effort and putting forth that work, you can't expect a very good harvest. I mean, you go to that judgment seat of Christ, he's going to be like, okay, well, you know, some people are already going to know. Uh, I mean, maybe some seed fell in my pocket somewhere and just happened to fall <laughs> in the right place. I don't know. I hope so. You don't want to be that person, right? You want to be getting the word of God. Get, get, preach that word. Reach people. Because ultimately, you know, we can't bring our money. We can't bring our clothing. We can't bring, our, we can't bring that stuff with us. But you know what you can bring with you is souls. You can bring to you. And that is eternal value. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? That has weight. That has value. We know that that has eternal value. We know it's what God has commanded us to do over and over and over again. We know it's a good work. We know that that, that is what God would have us focus on. We know that that is what Jesus Christ even came to this world for, to save sinners. You could have. No, you might wonder about all kinds of other things in your life. That winning people to Christ will bring reward because you're, they're going to be there. They'll be your joy and your crown and rejoicing. Amen. Which is why we focus on that so much. Hey, if other things get us rewards, great. But focus on the thing that has eternal value, and then you won't be disappointed 
at that, that judgment seat of Christ. And you'll be able to, to, to receive glory from God, which I, I, it's kind of unfathomable. Which is so why we see in heaven, you know, the, the men that have crowns casting their crowns before God. Like, like, we're not worthy of this crown. <laughs> like, you are, Lord. But he's still giving it to them. Another round. I'll read. I'll read through some of these. I, I, we're already past time, and let me just read a few more because there's there's so much good content here. References to crowns and receiving prizes. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty-two. The Bible says, "To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some." Great passage about winning souls to Christ. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Partaker with you. There's that connection with the others that are going to also be present at the resurrection. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Now it's talking about getting prizes. It's not the prize of eternal life. That's a gift. That's not a prize. That's given to you. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. I'm talking about people who literally run a physical race. That's a corruptible crown. That's going to go away. But we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. People who run physical races and run in the Olympics and everything else, that's not certain. But this race is certain. Amen. We can know exactly how to do it, and you all have the potential to win. Amen. And there doesn't have to only be one winner. In the carnal world, there's one winner. There's only one prize. God's looking to give out prizes to everyone, to all the workers, to all the laborers. He's going to reward you. We have our own race to run. Amen. It's a race that you could that that is going to just be. In, it's not a competition. In, in a world, even if everyone was terrible, <laughs> someone's going to win, <laughs> right? You could have the race of the turtles. <laughs> it's not very exciting. There's really not much glory to that, but someone, one of them will eventually win. You might have people, you know, tell them to turn around this way and that way and everything else, and it's going to take forever, and someone might win. But it's not that way with God. If, if you are the turtle, you have, you have nothing. But if you run your race, it doesn't, mat it doesn't matter if Brother Peter is outrunning me. That doesn't matter for me. I can still be victorious in my race. Amen. Amen. His walk doesn't influence the Lord. I can still win. So you don't have to look and be like, oh, man, this guy is just, I mean, he's just going to win, so I'm just going to quit. No. <laughs> you win your race. God's got prizes for you. He's got rewards. He's got crowns. He says, I therefore so run, not certainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he's, he's keeping his body in line, in tune. You're trying to be free from sin. But what is he doing in his race? Preaching to others. Notice another reference to others in order to win that prize. The work is with other people. You're building a uh, on the foundation of other people. Philippians 4.1 says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. My brethren, dearly beloved, he's talking to my brethren, and then he calls them my joy and crown. You're my joy and crown. You're my crown other people you want to win a crown win other people build up other people focus on other people so stand fast in the Lord my dearly beloved 
2 Timothy 4, verse 5, But watch thou in all things, and do afflictions, do the work of an is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only. So look, I've kept the, look, I've lived my life, I've kept the faith, I've stayed strong, I've stayed in it, I've stayed in the ministry, I know I've done the work of God. This is near the end of the Apostle Paul's life. He's saying, I know that I've got a crown waiting for me now. Oh, that's real arrogant of you. No, it's not arrogant of him. He trusts in the word of God. And he knows he's been serving the Lord. And he knows the work that he's been doing. And he knows that God is faithful. And he knows that God's going to reward. There's nothing proud or boastful about him. He's, just, he's happy. But he's, he's also not just thinking, well, it's just for me. See, I've, out, I've outworked all of you guys. No. He says, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Amen. Hey, there's a crown for you too. Amen. I don't have time to get into this, but there's a lot so to people who will receive the crown, for those who endured and suffered in afflictions and, and heavy persecution, martyrs, people will receive a better resurrection. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about it's a hall of faith. It talks about all these great people of God. People have served the Lord and done, done so many uh, mighty things. And it says that they will, um, it says what women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection they already knew they were saved they knew they already have a resurrection coming but because they stayed faithful even in the hardest times even in the times of being martyred and being tortured and being killed for the cause of christ they, they went through it because they say you know what i'm going to get a better resurrection now why is it better because god's going to give you that many more rewards that's the example of someone who loses their life early you can say yeah but you know, that's not fair because they could have lived longer and earned more rewards. No, it is fair because if you lose your life that way, God's going to give you <laughs> all the rewards that you could have missed out on for your whole life. You get them all right there for making that stand. Amen. That's a better resurrection. Yep. Uh, and say anything's not fair about God, the righteous judge, who do you think you are? God is determines <laughs> what's fair and what's right. We need to get in line with God's righteousness and not come up with our own. But of course it's fair. He, he, and we know that God is just, and, and God is more than fair. God is long-suffering and, and good, and his mercy endureth forever. I'm going to have to cover that another day. There's a, there's a whole, that's a whole sermon in itself. It is. Turn if you to Luke 14, last, last passage, last passage. I, just, I want to close on this. Just I'm skipping a lot. We'll close on this point. Oh, wow. Luke chapter 14, verse number 12, the Bible reads, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. Look at this. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. God has a special place when you do things. One, that's going to demonstrate that you truly care and you're sincere. You're not just doing something to get something back, right? Now, I'll use anyone up here, for example. Brother, Brother Michael, right? If I take Brother Michael out to eat, 
I know he's probably a situation, he could take me out to eat, we could kind of go back and forth and kind of play this game and, 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 oh yeah, I really love brother so-and-so, and we go out, and there's nothing wrong with, with, with doing that, right? There's nothing wrong with taking a friend out to eat or something like that, but that's not, you know, don't be thinking that that's going to earn you some great rewards. What the Bible's saying here, look, if you take, you, you help people out and you do stuff for people, they can't, they can't recompense you. God sees that. God sees that work, and he says, I like that. The gift that God gave us, none of us can do on our own. That salvation gift. So when you go forward and you do good and you help people out and you provide for those that can't provide for themselves, God says, you know what? I'm going to reward you. Amen. I will pay you back. You will be rewarded, and not just re not rewarded. You're not even talking about like in this life. You're going to get recompense at the resurrection of the just, Amen. Amen. at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know about you, but whatever I could give <laughs> to then get a, a recompense at this place, at the re it's worth all. Here, take it all. <laughs>If I could trade this for some eternal reward, because what is that going to do me? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <laughs> Not even here, but. <laughs> uh, 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 one little gemstone of eternal way more than the, than the pieces of paper that the government gives you and calls money. <laughs> That's another sermon for another day. <laughs> but look at this now, okay? Verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and set it and see it. I pray to have an excuse. And on and on. And, on. and then all these excuses are made. And then he teaches. Now look, that statement is true. Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. He was, Jesus was just talking about being rewarded at the judgment of grace. He's just saying, hey, blessed is he that, that even could just eat bread at the kingdom of God. And that's true. But then Jesus goes on to explain, yeah, a lot of you think you're saved. You're going to eat bread in the kingdom of God, and you're not. This is, this is the, the, the revealing where he's like, hey, I have this supper ready, and I called, but you all were too busy, all that other things going on, and now, and now you're not here, and now you're not making it to that great dinner table. You know, these people assumed that they were going to make it, and, you know, you might even argue, you know, the person that said that might, might have been thinking, like, I haven't done anything, but I'm just happy I'm going to be there. And then Jesus is saying, like, no, you're not even going to be there. <laughs> like, <laughs> you might want to check that first. And then take up your cross and follow me. And, you know, Jesus, that's above every name. But Jesus Christ has also humbled himself lower than anyone. I mean, he, he, he came in, and now he has all of the glory. And if you want glory, you want to have a great house built, don't focus on your house. Focus on other people's. Build their house. And then you see that work abide the fire, and you see them, you know, you invest in the people. And you could see that all, there's so many examples of this. Read all the epistles of Paul. Read all this. All these churches are being followed up on. And what is the care? The care is for them. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. The heart, the soul, the desire, laboring day and night for other people. That is what it's all about. And that is how you'll be judged. And that is how you'll earn rewards. And that is what God is pleased with. And that is what's going to do you good in eternity.
us bow our heads, our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your generosity that not only are you willing to give us eternal life as a gift, but that you would also reward us and, and pay us and have crowns and prizes, dear Lord, for us by doing the things that, that you've commanded us to do, by, do, by, by working for you, by, by, by getting in the yoke and, and, and plowing, dear Lord. I, and, and we thank you for being so generous and so kind and so loving. And I pray that you please help us to, to keep the right focus, Lord. Keep the focus on the things that are not seen and not get distracted with the cares and the thoughts of this world that could choke us out and cause us to, to not even have um, anything that has eternal weight. Lord, help us to, to see the things that are, that are not seen. Help us to focus on the, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones that, that, that have eternal value, not the ones in this life, dear Lord, but um, help us to keep that focus and, and to not get distracted. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.